Truth in History with Charles A. Jennings. Welcome to Truth in History. There is a doctrine that has been prevalent among the Christian church for many decades. And that doctrine is the immortality of the soul. Now, among Christian churches and seminaries and evangelical church at large, this is what is taught, is that when a person dies, their soul either goes to heaven or hell. And is that a biblical doctrine? Is that a biblical concept? And we want, to dis uh, uh, we want to explore that subject today because it's a very important one, because every one of us has gone to funerals where the pastor or the minister officiating the funeral service has put somebody in heaven or in hell, according to his own judgment. And is that true? Does the Bible actually teach the transmigration of the soul? Is it pagan or is it Christian? Now, I have entitled this program, Are You Dead or Alive After Death? Are You Dead or Alive? There are many doctrines in the church that are not correct. But this one, the immortality of the soul, actually comes from pre-Christian philosophy. And its greatest proponent of this was Plato, uh, an ancient Greek philosopher. And it later became part of Christian doctrine. And during that intertestamental period of 400 years between Malachi and Matthew, um, post-exilic rabbis began to incorporate that into their teaching from Greek philosophy. So, when we look at this doctrine that is taught today, it has its roots in ancient Greek philosophers such as Plato mixed with Hellenistic culture and then blended with ancient Judaism and they mixed the rabbis took these thoughts, put them into the Talmud, mix them with the law of God or the law of Moses, and Jesus called them the commandments of men. And then when the Roman Catholic Church came along, they perpetuated this because it, this doctrine or this belief made its way through the era of the apostles and also, a couple centuries later, as the church began to go from the apostolic age to the church father age or the bishops of the early church, they carried this doctrine with them. And then when the Roman Catholic Church was officially established, then they perpetuated this concept. And for hundreds of years, they taught purgatory, which the soul of man would have to be alive in order to go to a place called purgatory. And then it came through the Reformation into Protestantism. And for some reason, so many people, even the evangelical people that supposed to believe the Bible, believe in the immortality of the soul and the transmigration of the soul from one place to another. 
It's pagan influence. Now, we Christians read our Bible, and it tells us that the wages of sin is death. That's Romans 6, 23. For the, the wages of sin is death. Well, what is death? Death is the separation of the Spirit of God or the breath of life out of your mortal physical body. It means separation. When the Spirit leaves the body, Solomon said, the Spirit goes back to God who gave it. The body is mortal. It's physical. And it decays and actually goes back to earth. Well, what about the soul? Your soul is your mentality, your will, and your emotions. That is what makes up your soul. But your will, mentality, and emotions cannot be expressed except it has a body, a physical body. So the Bible tells us that when God created Adam, he did not give him a soul. When God breathed into Adam, he became a living soul. He became a person. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Adam was dust. That is quite simple to understand. Just dirt. And we'll go back to dirt. And breathe into his nostrils. God breathed into Adam's nostrils. The breath of life. And man became a living soul or a living person. A body. It was there. Adam's body made out of the dust of the ground was there. But it was dead. Well, where was the soul? Did he have a soul before then? No. Only when God breathed into him the breath of life, he became a living person. A be he became a living person. And I want to stress that. He became a person or a soul. So how many souls or persons went down to Egypt? with Jacob. Seventy souls went down. Now, this common belief in Christianity, and it's taught by learned men, is that the soul is a disembodied spirit. And I heard one man say, very popular preacher on TV, and well-known, travels the world, and so forth, and even has researchers working for him. He said when Judas Iscariot died, his spirit and his soul went to hell. Where is that in the Bible? Where is that within the pages of your Bible? It's not there. But people believe it. They didn't question the man because of tradition. We have been taught that for so long. But it's, it's just what Jesus said, the traditions of men or the commandments of men. So what is your spirit? The spirit or the breath of life is that which God breathes into a person at conception. That's why we are against abortion. 
God breathes life into that person, and it develops in the womb of its mother and becomes an independent individual. That body is physical. It's a physical substance made from the dust of the ground. And when God's breath enters that body, that person becomes a living soul just like Adam. Now, the invisible spirit or the breath of God is the eternal part of you. That's the eternal part of you. The pagan concept that has come into Christian doctrine is that your soul also is a spirit. So these teachers are telling you that you have two spirits. When you die, you have two disembodied spirits floating around. And they say, as soon as a person dies, this is Christian theology known today, which is really not Christian, that when a person dies, their, quote, soul goes immediately, if they're an unbeliever, goes immediately to hell. Or if they're a Christian, their soul goes immediately to heaven. And therefore, they teach that, you know, Grandma was a Christian, a wonderful saint, and she's now up there hugging angels, and she's drinking of the water of life. And old Grandpa, he's up there singing in the heavenly choir with all of his friends. Joe and John and Bill and all the others. And he may even be playing his violin. That's nonsense. And it has given rise to a lot of these modern day prophets and prophetesses that go to heaven, sometimes weekly, and it's all subjective. It's all man-centered. It's all humanistic. It's all anthropocentric because they go up there and it was, it's all about them. An angel leading them around from mansion to mansion and taking them up on a big hill. And, you know, do you want to see Jesus? We will introduce you to Jesus in a minute. But you know, you've just got to wait a little bit and until he makes his entrance into this special room. But in the meantime, you can go visit with Gabriel. You can go visit with Michael. You can go visit with so-and-so, you know, with your family that has gone on before. Folks, that's paganism. How did it get into Christian doctrine is one thing we know, but why it remains is because of biblical ignorance and tradition. So they, they, they meaning those that teach this doctrine, even teach that Jesus, when he died, went to hell. I heard a man on YouTube the other day, he gave this one hour long talk on why Jesus went to hell. And he had these different verses and he put them together. But really what it was, was a combination of some scripture misinterpreted, tradition and imagination and imagination, and he came up 
with this concept that Jesus spent three days and three nights in hell. What would Jesus have done in hell? He said Jesus was either doing one or two things, or maybe both. He was preaching to all the Old Testament people, I guess saints and sinners alike. He was preaching to them. Number two, he was making some kind of an announcement that he was the Son of God and that he had arrived and that he's come to take some of those people out of paradise and take them to heaven. Well, when Jesus died, this is what it's this is what the Bible tells us. Luke, the gospel writer, says, and when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. His spirit went back to God who gave it. Because Jesus was 100% God and 100% man, two natures in one person. But he was a man. He had a physical body. And that body was subject to pain and hunger. It was subject to death. And Jesus knew this. So when he died, he, get, he cried with a loud voice, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. In other words, his spirit was released from his body, and it went back to God who gave it. His body was put in the tomb. Jesus was dead. The Bible tells us he tasted death for every man. He tasted death for every man. It does not tell us that Jesus, his spirit or his soul or any part of him, went to hell and was walking around. And was he walking around in fire? Was his body being burned? They say some of these teachers tell us that he had to go to hell to complete his work. That's blasphemy. That's teaching the insufficiency of the cross. The cross is where he died. The cross is where he shed his blood. We're saved by the shedding of his blood. We're not saved by him going to hell. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7, it says, In whom we have redemption through his blood. Where was his blood shed? On the top side of the earth, on the cross, outside of the city of old Jerusalem. It was not shed in hell. Jesus did not go to hell. Well, the evidence that some people give concerning Jesus going to hell, they say it's in the Apostles' uh, Creed. It's in the Apostles' Creed. It doesn't matter. The Apostles did not write the Apostles' Creed. It was written decades, maybe hundreds of years later. There's some things in there that's correct, many things. But that part, when it said he descended into hell, is wrong. They say that some people say that John Calvin taught it. Well, is John Calvin's writings equal with Scripture? Or is Dr. So-and-so's writings equal with Scripture? No. So we can't go by the fact that 
those two sources taught it. When we have the Bible to tell us differently. I want to read you a statement from the Jewish Encyclopedia. The rabbis and the scholars, the Jewish scholars that wrote this part, they got it right. This is the Jewish Encyclopedia under the entry Immortality of the Soul. Quote, the belief that the soul continues its existence after the dissolution of the body is a matter of philosophical or theological speculation rather than of simple faith and is accordingly nowhere expressly taught in Holy Scripture. Unquote. I think that is clear enough. It also states, this encyclopedia also states, the belief in a continuous life of the soul, which underlines primitive ancestor worship and the rites of necromancy, talking to the dead, practice also in ancient Israel, was discouraged and suppressed by the prophets and the lawgivers as antagonistic to the belief in the God of life. It's antagonistic. Now, It goes on to say that the belief in the immortality of the soul came to the Jews. This is still from the Jewish Encyclopedia. The belief in the immortality of the soul came to the Jews from contact with Greek thought and chiefly through the philosophy of Plato, its principal exponent who was led to it through Orphic and Ellicinian mysteries in which Babylonian and Egyptian views were strangely blended, unquote. Now, what is Ellicinian mysteries? Its secret religious rites in ancient Greece celebrated every spring of the death and resurrection of vegetation. Kind of sounds like a pagan Easter thing. And what is this Orphic philosophy? Orphic is a Greek philosophy from or Orpheus, a musician whose magic ability on the lyre or lyre, however you want to pronounce it, affected beasts, rocks, and trees. He sought release for his dead wife from the underworld. It's pagan. Now, from reading the Jewish encyclopedia's definition, we learn this, in which we already know. Number one, the immortality of the soul is not taught in Holy Scripture. Number two, the underlying premise of primitive, primitive ancestor worship and the rites of necromancy or talking to the dead. And number three, that this doctrine was adopted by the Jews through the philosophy of Plato, who learned it from Babylonian and Egyptian mysteries. The Jewish historian Josephus made this remark. He was talking to the Greeks one day concerning Hades, and he said, 
For while you believe that the soul is created and yet is made immortal by God, according to the doctrine of Plato, he knew it. Why don't our Bible seminary professors know it? They've got the alphabet behind their name. When I went to college many years ago, that is, the professor who was a learned doctorate, doctor of divinity and so forth, and he was talking about life after death. And he even pointed out that it's Jewish tradition that the underworld or the place of the state of the dead once had a dual compartment, one here and one there, a dual compartment. And this came out of Plato, Greek, Egyptian, Babylonian tradition incorporated into ancient Judaism. And they said that these two compartments, one called paradise and the other one called hell, good people went to paradise, bad people went to hell. But that compartment in the underworld, according to tradition, was only separated by four inches. Four inches, which is about that much. So you better aim good. And one Jewish rabbi said it was a a hand breath, about like this. And another one said it was only separated by the distance of two fingers. So you better be a good shot. So the tr tradition was that when a person dies, their immortal, quote, immortal soul went to the underworld and if they were bad, they went to hell. If they were good, they went to paradise. And they were down there in the same compartment, basically separated by some sort of space. Was it a wall or was it just empty space? We don't know. And when Jesus died, they say, he went to hell. But he reached over into paradise and lifted those people up, and he took them to heaven with him. Now, when did he do this? Because when he was on the cross and he died, according to the book of Luke, Jesus said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. So his spirit went back to God while his body was still hanging on the cross before he was buried in the tomb. Before he spent, quote, three days and three nights in hell. So his spirit would have had to come back from the Father, go to hell, and then after 72 hours, lead these people out. It doesn't make sense, folks. That's why I ask, are you dead or alive when you die? You're dead. Your soul is made up of your mentality, your emotions, and your will. Where is your mentality when you're dead? Where is your emotions? Where is your will? They don't exist.
because there's no period of time for, we'll say, some sinner to go to hell. And some sinners have been there, they say, for hundreds of years. Some of them will only be there for minutes before the alleged rapture takes place. And they're suffering, they're burning, their flesh is falling off their bones. You, you've seen the, the movies that some of these people have made. And some of them are drinking because they were a drunkard in life. The prostitutes are, you know, they're plying their trade. And the thieves are stealing from one another. The liars are sitting around lying, card playing. You've heard it all. I've heard it all. I've seen the movies. You say, yes, but Mr. So-and-so, I saw him on religious television, and he spent 23 minutes in hell. Well, I think that there's a, an explanation for that. And I don't have time to go into all of it now, but it's when his mind, his brain, and his body was in severe trauma. And it was a dream. Just like you dream some weird stuff, even when you're healthy, really weird. And you relate it to what you know. You relate it to what you have been taught. And these people that go to heaven, I have never heard one give a testimony that is equivalent to what John the Revelator gave in the book of Revelation. His message was Christ-centered. When all these people die and go to heaven, somebody said he spent 11 hours in heaven. Wow, that's a long time. And he saw all these angels, and he petted horses, and, and they were kind of strange. And the grass was green, then it turned brown, then it turned blue, and the flowers, it's all humanistic. Paul said he went to paradise, but it was something that he saw and heard that he could not describe it. It was unutterable. People, when they have these experiences, they relate the mind, the subconscious mind relates them to what they know here on earth. Grass, water, trees, animals, angels with wings that are 10 foot wingspan, you know, all types of stuff. Um, you might say, yes, but the Bible says that Jesus went to hell. Well, Adam Clark, we're all familiar with Adam Clark, the great Methodist commentator. This is what he said. He said, the Bible states this. In Acts 2.24, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death. Unquote. 
But instead of saying death, the Codex Biza, the Syriac, the Coptic, and the Vulgate took out the word death and put in the word hell. And there's where it got into, quote, our Bible. So when Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, Acts 2.24, whom God hath raised up, speaking of Christ, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it or bound by it. You see, O death, where is thy sting? Death, separation, your spirit separated from your body. It didn't say, O oh, hell is where is your sting? It said, O oh, death. And then the grave, where is your victory? Sheol is the grave. And then he goes on and talks about David. Um, and he talks concerning David. In verse 29, he said, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried. Dead and buried. And his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Now, David, he said, we can point to his grave, and he's dead dead. He's not floating around in heaven somewhere. He's not floating around in paradise in the nether part of the world or the under part of the world. No, he's dead. Say, well, what about Luke 16, the rich man and Lazarus? I'm really not going to go there right now because that's a story within itself. But I will say this, that the parable, a parable, it was a parable, not a real story. The parable of the rich man and Lazarus has absolutely nothing to do with life after death nothing. There is an explanation for it. And that will have to come in a subsequent lesson. Because if it applies to life after death for Lazarus and the rich man, You have to really, really stretch things to make it fit. Well, what about Ephesians 4, 8 to 11? It said he, the phrase, the lower parts of the earth. The lower parts of the earth refers to the fallen, sinful, nature of man where we live. And it goes on to tell us that he gave gifts unto men, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, and teacher. Did he do that in hell? No, he did that on the top side of the earth. This is where apostles and prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists exist on the top side of the earth, not in hell. 
They take that verse in Ephesians chapter 4 and say, well, that's proof that Jesus went to hell and that he, when he left there after three days and three nights, He took spirits with him. He led captivity captive. And he gave gifts to men. Well, where did he give the gifts to? Or where did he give the gifts? He that descended from the heavens is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Now he that ascended, which is it, but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He descended and he ascended far above heavens, and he gave some apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists. He did that on the earth. They say, well, what about first Peter chapter three? Let's turn to that passage in 1 Peter chapter 3. In verse 18, it says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened, by the Spirit, and then there's a semicolon, or a colon there, excuse me, the two dots. Who put that there? It was the translators. Going back to verse 18, it says, but quickened by the Spirit by which leave out that colon, by which also he went and preached under the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved. Now, when or how was the preaching of the gospel? How was the preaching of the gospel given to the antediluvian people in Genesis chapter 6? I'm turning to Genesis chapter 6 and verse number Three. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his day shall be a hundred and twenty years. Now, some people said, Well, the Lord said man's life is going to be a hundred and twenty years. One man said, I'm going to live to be a hundred and twenty years old. That's not what it means. Noah was building the ark for 120 years. And God gave that generation of Noah a chance to believe, and he, that chance lasted for 120 years. And Peter said, it was by the Spirit of God that the gospel was preached unto that generation for 120 years. That's why Genesis 
6, 3 says, My spirit shall not always strive with man. My spirit shall not always give you a chance. At, after the 120 year mark, the flood came. No more chance. So it has nothing to do with Jesus going to hell and preaching to the spirits of the people that were bound in hell or in prison that lived during the days of Noah. Jesus did not have to go to hell for our salvation. He said in two or three different places during his ministry, I've come to finish my father's work. And on the cross in John 9, 19, 30, he said, it is finished. We're saved. How? By his death. On the cross. And we are justified. In Romans 4, 25, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Our hope as Christians is in the resurrection. Jesus as a man, died. He was dead three days and three nights, just like he said, 72 hours. And he tasted death for every Adam man. He conquered death. For everyone that believes. So therefore, was it necessary for him to go to hell? I mean, was his flesh burning? I mean, it's, I think it's very obvious, very clear where this doctrine of the immortality of the soul came from. I want to read you a list that of several things that are results of the belief in the immortality of the soul. Satan's first lie is, go ahead and eat of that tree, ye shall not surely die. I'm going to read you this list. As a, there, these beliefs or events or practices are results of the paganistic belief in the immortality of the soul that came from Plato, Greek philosophers, Babylonian, and Egyptian mysteries. Number one, reincarnation. Think about it, folks. Just think about reincarnation. Soothsaying. Number three, Emotional sentimentalism. What do I mean by that? Well, the example of that is I heard some young lady, she was in college, taking a test, and she said, you know, I passed my test, and my mother that had died, she's in heaven, she helped me on the test. 
she gave me the test uh, answers to the college exam, and I passed. That's nonsense. Divination. And we could go into all these from a biblical standpoint in denouncing these things. Magic. Necromancy. Talking to the dead. The observing of times. The mediation to dead saints. Roman Catholicism is full of this. Ancestor worship. Sorcery. Prognostication. Trying to prophesy, you know. Palm reading. Transmigration. Spiritualism. Prayers and food for the dead. Now, you see this carried out occasionally. I remember watching the news when that plane went down in the Japanese sea. And a lot of Japanese people were on the plane, lost their lives. And their relatives went out on a boat to where the plane went down, and they threw food in there, threw food into the ocean for their loved ones would have something to eat in the afterlife. Prayers and food for the dead. The next one is eternal torture. Boy, that's a hot button. Halloween. You can only have Halloween if you believe in the immortality of the soul. Familiar spirits. Witchcraft. Wizardry. Charms. Purgatory and indulgences. Enchantment. Astrology or stargazing. So I have listed one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty one, twenty two, twenty three. I've listed twenty three different things that are connected with the pagan concept of the immortality of the soul. Now, where do you go when you die, saint or sinner? The body goes in the ground. I think that's quite obvious. Your spirit goes back to God who gave it. And your soul, mentality, emotions, and will does not exist. You lie there and rest. Revelation says, Blessed are they that die in the Lord, for they shall rest from their labors. But their works do follow. They're waiting for the resurrection. They're waiting for the resurrection of the dead. And the moment you pass is the moment you rise. Pastor George Southwick said that, and he's ever correct. George Southwick came to this very truth that the moment you pass is the moment you rise. There is no time consciousness in the grave. And we are waiting. As Christians, we live in hope. 
of the resurrection of the dead. When the trumpet shall sound, and it says, and we shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and many shall come forth, some to everlasting life, others to everlasting judgment. So I hope that this has been helpful to everyone because I face this quite often in conducting funerals. Invariably, someone will come up to me and said, Where's, where do you go when you die? You know, let me give you one, one more illustration. A person is like salt. It's made up of two chemicals, sodium and chloride. And you bring them together, you got salt. You separate them, salt doesn't exist. So, folks, live in hope. Your loved ones and we someday will lie in this earth. But our hope is in the one that has overcome death. He has overcome death. If you would like a copy, a free copy of our magazine, just write us, contact us, call us somehow, and we'll be glad to send you a free copy. And as I close, I say, live in hope, not in fear, for Jesus Christ is coming back, and someday we'll hear his voice, just like Lazarus heard his voice when he said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came out of that grave. We also shall rise in newness of life. God bless you.